I'm Adam Lowe, the Executive Secretary of NASEP, and I am thrilled by your enthusiasm in this room this morning. It gives me equal pleasure to introduce Stan Jones to you. The program lists out a few of his many accomplishments, but I wanted to take a few minutes to give you a sense of how those accomplishments were achieved. I first met Stan towards the end of his dozen years as Indiana Commissioner of Higher Education. At that point, he had already earned his place among a few selected individuals with lasting dramatic impact on the quality of education in Indiana. And yet he was fully engaged in conversations about the nitty gritty details of dual credit policy language before shifting with ease to the big picture vision of the role of accelerated coursework in collegiate success. Indiana is a state with a commission on higher education. Its regulatory authority is by design limited such that the institutions of higher education maintain considerable autonomy. Yet Stan affected remarkable changes in the structure of Indiana education and K-12 education through the power of moral authority. He never built a huge empire at the commission. It remains a small agency when you look at the number of positions they have, particularly when compared to the Department of Education and with the administrations at each of the public institutions of higher education. It was his use of the bully pulpit, a relentless emphasis on data and outcomes and an impatience for the status quo that led to higher standards and college readiness expectations for both high school students, the establishment of the state's first true community college system, and a particular relevance to the folks in this room, the adoption of the first state policy in the country to require NASEP accreditation of all public post-secondary institutions offering college credit taught by high school teachers. Always a trailblazer, with no further ado, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Stan Jones. Uh, thank you, Adam. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, just uh, by way of introduction as to what uh, Complete College America is, uh, we worked real hard uh, to make it pretty clear that we're about college completion, hence our name, <laughs> Complete College America. Uh, it's, a, it's a laser focus that we have uh, on this issue. Uh, many other issues are tempting, but this is, our, uh, uh, this is really our focus. Uh, we uh, also have a focus at s in, in respect to state policy, uh, working principally with governors, with legislators, with key higher education officials uh, within states uh, to bring about change through state policy. Uh, in, as part of doing that, uh, we set up an alliance of states, uh, asked states to join, and initially we thought we might work with four, five, six states as a way to get started. Uh, immediately, our, our call was uh, responded to by 17 states, uh, and now we have 32 states in the District of Columbia that we're working with as part of our network. Uh, we started, we're relatively new, we started three years ago, uh, and so this has been pretty rapid growth, and I think it's really not so much a testimony to our work as it is a testimony to the importance uh, of this issue of college completion. The, the, um, one of the, when Adam asked me to speak at this conference, um, uh, it reminded me actually of, of, uh, of one of uh, my more challenging meetings that I had at the Commission uh, for Higher Education when I was the commissioner. And uh, we had, uh, we have monthly meetings and we have presentations and uh, we had a presentation, at, an annual presentation of the of the SAT scores and the ACT scores for the juniors and seniors that year. And of course, as you probably always read, ACT paints this very bleak picture that only one third of the college students, or, um, the high school students are ready for college. Uh, and SAT uh, does a little bit differently, but essentially paints that same argument. Uh, and so we went through probably <coughs> an hour, hour and a half of this discussion uh, in front of our commission um, and the, uh, the group that had come to attend. So in an unfortunate schedule of timing, uh, we turned then to talk about our dual credit policy. And so my chairman, who was a banker, turned to me and he said, Stan, now that you've thoroughly painted this picture about how underprepared students are for college, you are now going to attempt to convince us that they are ready to take college courses in high school. <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> and I'm sure that's a dilemma you face as well. How do we have this constant struggle between the recognition that many, many of the students that we have in high school are not ready for college, but will go to college, um, and at the same time that there are students that could benefit by college work in high school. 
Uh, it's always a dilemma that I've found challenging and I'm sure that you do in your work. Um, as I talk today, uh, some of the things I, I mention uh, and talk about may become obvious to you uh, in its relationship to dual credit and to concurrent enrollment. Uh, others may be less obvious and I'll, I'll try to, to point those out. As a, way, as a way to start, one of the, uh, I think, more interesting things that I've not seen written uh, in the newspapers about this recession, uh, when everybody's concerned about whether we have, it, people are buying more houses, buying more cars, getting more jobs, uh, one of the things that's kind of sailed through this recession is college enrollment. Uh, we've had record enrollment in this country uh, every year uh, since uh, the recession started. Uh, especially so at the community colleges uh, that have seen double-digit increases. And to me, this kind of represents, um, I think, something rather interesting. It represents a lot of people who have kind of looked at their own economic set of circumstances and decided that their best bet uh, to a better future for their family is to go to college. Um, and many of these students, uh, are, are, they have families, they have jobs, uh, modest economic circumstances, but yet they've chosen to take their time and their money and go to college. Uh, that's a huge vote of confidence uh, in our college system throughout the country, uh, in your college, uh, in, in the work that you do. This actually goes back um, decades. Uh, I always say if, uh, that one of the things that's built into uh, the DNA of higher education is access. Um, we've, we've always prided ourselves as a country on access. It didn't always used to be the case. Uh, in the 40s, uh, my father went to college on the GI Bill, as many fathers did. Uh, before that, we only had 8% uh, of the adult population had a four-year college degree. College was an elite and expensive enterprise. Um, and that's changed dramatically. The GI Bill started that, but decades of effort through access, building campuses uh, throughout the country, uh, accommodating the baby boom during the 60s and the 70s, uh, strong financial aid programs at the federal and the state level, uh, programs specifically for women so that have been so successful. We have many more women in college than men, uh, and strong programs for minorities. And in fact, you can say it's been so successful that this uh, freshman class is more representative of this country than it ever has been. We have more uh, blacks, we have more Latinos, we have more first-generation students, we have more low-income students than we ever have had in this country's history. We've also been successful with convincing high school students to go to college. That pipeline's strong. Uh, right away, about two-thirds of graduating seniors go to college, and within a year, 75% uh, of graduating seniors go to college. Uh, so that pipeline is very strong going on to college. But it's fair to ask, what happens to that fall class when you fast forward to graduation day in the spring and they go up on the stage? Uh, we know if you went to a four-year college, only half of them are still there. If you went to a two-year college, only a third of them are still there. And that, that diversity that we prided ourselves on in that freshman class is largely gone. Uh, the graduating class is overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly middle and upper middle class. Uh, and many of that, those aspirations uh, that were so terribly important, we've lost along the way. It, it's so, one of the, I see lots of numbers and, and some are surprising and others are not, but one of the ones that I'll never forget is when I was in the state legislature um, and I was just, you know, reading through my stack and uh, got, I saw somebody was here from Iowa. This is a, I got this report from a researcher who, uh, sitting out in Iowa doing this research. Um, and essentially, this was in 1988, um, so over 20 years ago. And it said that if you were born into a family in the upper income quartile, you had a 77% chance of getting a four-year degree. If, on the other hand, you were born into a family in the lowest income quartile, you had a 7% chance of getting a four-year college degree. And I was stunned by that. I mean, I knew we had some inequality in the system, but th that discrepancy, 10 to 1, 11 to 1, was just to me just startling. Um, fast forward about 20 years, I saw these same numbers a couple years ago. They have not changed hardly at all. Still about three-quarters of those born in the upper uh, quartile 
um, get a four-year college degree, and less than 10% of those in the lowest quartiles uh, get a four-year college degree. And so we've prided higher education as being that stepping stone, that opportunity. Um, and in many, many cases, many individual cases, um, that has been true. Uh, but as a country, it really has not been true uh, that it's given, um, changed those dynamics for so many low-income first-generation students. So where do we start? Um, we started, um, and, and this is uh, not where I'd intended to start, uh, but we started with data. Uh, the federal, and I know many of you know this, but the federal database is iPads. Um, and it has some, uh, on one hand, there's a lot of great data there, but there's some significant missing pieces. Uh, for example, they don't count, they don't, can't tell you graduation rates for part-time students. And part-time students now represent 40% of all the students in the country. Amazingly, they can't tell you what the graduation rates are for Pell students. And to me, this was overwhelming that we spend billions of dollars, I think about $12 billion a year on Pell students, and the federal government cannot tell us whether those students graduate. Uh, they can't tell us, I know a lot of places and states and colleges have initiatives to bring older students back to college. Uh, they can't tell you whether older students graduate because they don't have an age um, a criteria as part of their calculations. Uh, and interestingly enough, they can't tell you if transfer students graduate. Uh, we spend huge amounts of effort on transfer, but they can't tell you whether those students graduate from the institution that they finally went to. So we decided, working with the National Governors Association, uh, to launch a metrics project of our own. And we came up with metrics that I think are important, uh, that many higher education officials kind of weighed in on, uh, to adopt a set of 12 metrics that are really pretty simple. Uh, in addition to the typical outcome measures like graduation rates, numbers of degrees, uh, we also, and especially this became important for community colleges, we collected and reported information on what are called momentum points. Uh, I know the state of Washington is well represented here, and I know your community colleges use those uh, pretty completely, but things like how many start in remediation, how many complete remediation, how many complete first year courses in math and English, uh, how many students accumulate 24 credit hours in their first year, um, how many come back the second year, so the kind of momentum points that give clear signals to whether students are on track to graduate. Uh, we launched this project, collected uh, data from uh, 30 states. Uh, we're in our second year of collection, and we also are collecting data from 750 colleges throughout the country. Um, and, and using that, we produced a report called Time is the Enemy. And I'm going to share with you uh, some of the results of that report today. Um, that I think both illustrate our problems and our opportunities in the whole effort to improve college completion. Uh, the first, um, and only the first, because this is the first place uh, that students start, is in remediation. And in, I could be in any state in this country and say that 60% of students start at a community college start in remedial courses, and that would be true. And if you places people come up to me and say that actually stand at 70% in our state. Or as you might well know in some community colleges it's as high as 80 or 90%. But significant numbers almost anywhere in the country this would be true. It's also true at many, many four-year institutions especially if they're access uh, institutions. Uh, and nationwide our numbers say about 20% of the starts at four-year colleges start in remedial courses um, and about 60% at two-year colleges start in remedial courses. What, what is not necessarily known, it's starting to become known that we have huge numbers that start, but there's a couple things in addition to that that people don't know. Uh, I, I found this out actually in Indiana before I left. I got a call from our community college in Indiana, which is statewide, and they said, Stan, your plan's not working. I said, what do you mean? All my plans work. Um, <laughs> They said, well, you encouraged us to recruit more students right out of high school, not wait till they were 25 and show up. And we've done that, and we've recruited them right out of high school, completing high school, into remedial courses in college. And nationwide, 60% of high school students who graduated in the spring, started a community college in the fall, start in remedial classes. So this, this 
thinking that remedial classes are for those adults, they've been out for a while, they also are overwhelmingly for high school students that have just graduated from high school and essentially retaking courses that they passed uh, when they were in high school. Probably what's even more astonishing is that the data that we collected, which actually supports um, several research studies, uh, principally by the Community College Research Center uh, from Columbia University, essentially says remediation as it is currently structured does not work. Um, and th that's kind of a stunning uh, conclusion, but the data is overwhelmingly that it's true. So much so uh, that let's say Adam and I were both assigned to a math remedial course. If Adam, thinking he's just a little bit smarter than me, uh, decided to skip those math remediation courses and start in a regular college bearing course, he actually would do better than I would do me taking the sequence to get to that course. And the data bears that out over and over again. And so, so why is this true? Students can take and do take remedial courses and they pass them. They can do that. But what happens is as many as 30% of students assigned to a remedial math course don't show for the first course. It's the scarlet R, I've been assigned to remediation. I don't want to go home and tell my family. I don't want to tell my friends. I don't want to stand there with a beer in my hand saying, well, I'm taking this remedial math course. Um, they quit. Uh, after I gave a speech like this in Texas, a state senator came up to me and he said, Stan, that is exactly what happened to my son. He went down to the community college. He signed up. He was enthusiastic. He was assigned remedial courses. He said, I'm quitting, Dad. I'm not doing this. Went down, signed up with the service. He said, now five years later, we have him back from Iraq. We're going to try it again. We hope with some different results. But this happens over and over again. I gave this speech at one of our uh, conventions, and an intern that had just started with us came up to me afterwards, grabbed my arm, and said, Stan, that's exactly what happened to me. I was assigned math 058 and then 059. Uh, I'm in tourism before I could get into the first class. Now, she's persistent enough that she got it done and eventually got a degree, but she is an exception. Uh, achieving the dream uh, did a study on math, and they said over 70% of the students assigned remedial math courses only never even attempt a regular college math class within two years. Not that they don't pass it, they don't even take it. Overwhelming numbers. The students, it's attrition. Even if they pass one course, they don't take the other. Uh, amazingly, we even have about a third of those that complete their sequence and don't take the regular math course. Texas, big numbers out of Texas. 40,000 students every year, every single year, start remedial math at the community colleges in Texas. Within three years, only 15% or 6,000 complete a college level math class. This repeats itself throughout the country, college after college after college. And it's because of these attrition points uh, between the courses. It's not because the students can't pass the class. And so what's the strategy? Um, and so we're advocating for thinking about remediation not as a prerequisite, but as a co-requisite. Does this sound familiar? Concurrent? Okay. Um, and the evidence is, both by research and by best practice, um, that, that as many as one half to two thirds of students, um, well, could be in credit bearing work and be successful. And so we say this is really a co-rec strategy. And it's as simple as, <coughs> I was in South Dakota a few weeks ago. They said, this is how we do it. We have English 101 and we have English 101 plus. And the difference is English 101 plus five days a week rather than three days a week. It's that simple. Um, Baltimore Community College, uh, they, they have their students stay 45 minutes after class, work with the same instructor. Uh, in San Marcos in Texas at the state college there, uh, they have two hours of required tutoring for every one class hour. Others use computer labs to supplement time in class. Uh, and they are getting remarkable results. In the current system, maybe one out of four students succeed uh, in, um, can actually get there and succeed in college level work. These best practices are getting two out of four and three out of four uh, success, dramatically better. Um, 
a minute on placement tests. Um, most colleges use AccuPlace or Compass. I actually like testing a lot, um, but these are really good $2 tests. Um, they are overused for what they can tell you. Uh, and the research is pretty um, brutal on placement tests cannot, are not predictive of college success and college success in these courses. And so I don't say don't use them, but in addition to that, we do know that uh, high school GPA, we do know that courses taken in high school uh, can be pretty much better predictors than the test, so we're arguing for multiple measures. Um, I talked a lot about math for two reasons. One is students are twice as likely to need math remediation as they are English, and they're twice as likely to fail in math as they are in English. So we have significant challenges in English as well. I don't want to suggest we don't. We do, and especially for English as second uh, uh, learners. Uh, but math I I is really a bigger stumbling block. Um, there's some, some rethinking, some uh, in, in some of you are part of this throughout the country, about should everybody be funneled through college algebra? And uh, so there's some, some strategies that to get more students into college statistics or into quantitative reasoning, uh, and that's developing across the country and, and supported and funded by some pretty significant uh, players in this area. And so that's also going into this strategy. Now, what does this have to do with concurrent enrollment? Uh, one of the things I think, I think you should think about, uh, and some of you may be doing, um, but there's two things happening here. One is that, um, as I've talked about the fact that some of this remediation doesn't work, I don't know that we want to replicate it in high school. Um, and so, there's some, so there are some strategies about um, thinking about making, thinking that your college, ma especially for community college, you have a college statistics class or a quantitative reasoning class uh, that could be taught in high school. Uh, if students can actually accomplish that work in high school, not only do they skip remediation because they would have gotten the math credit that they needed, but they're well on their way to being in their programs when they start. And that huge hurdle of remediation in that first level math class and that first level English class, if that could be done in high school as part of a dual credit concurrent strategy, that would be a significant um, change uh, for those students. And so if you're doing this, I want to hear about it. If you're not doing this, I'd like you to think about it. Um, th there's a model that I'd rec two models actually that I recommend. Uh, one by the Carnegie Corporation for the Advancement of Teaching. Uh, they're pushing what they call Statway and Quantway, which are two semester math classes uh, that, that uh, could be taught in high school. And the other one is from the Dana Center at the University of Texas. Uh, Yuri Treisman is, is really part of that effort. Uh, and they also have two semester statistics classes and two semester uh, quantitative reasoning classes. Um, the second thing I, I think you might want to think about in relation to this is we don't all know, we, we, we won't know until it happens how Common Core is going to play itself out. Um, but what's clear is that the first test that's given significant numbers of students are not going to pass. And there will be a move to say, well, let's remediate those students when they're in high school, which makes sense. However, we're not sure the evidence supports that remediation is going to be effective in high school any more than it was effective in college. And so some of these strategies of actually thinking about uh, two semester math courses, uh, two semester English courses in high school can, that can actually be the gateway courses for college, especially community college and open access for your institutions, we think would be highly effective strategies. Um, time. Is uh, we have kind of uh, three main themes that I think of as counterintuitive. Um, one of them is time. One of the big ones is time. Um, some of you, um, and that, hence our report, time is the enemy. Uh, some of you may have seen iPads for the first time reported on four-year graduation rates, six-year graduation rates, and for the first time, eight-year graduation rates. Well, the six-year graduation rate in the country is about 55 percent for four-year colleges. And the eight-year graduation rate is about 58%. So those last two years got us an additional 3%. If you're there after year six, I say you may be living the dream, but you're not achieving the dream. <laughs> um, I, some of you may have seen an old Doonesbury cartoon where they, I think he was there six, seven, eight years. They forced him to graduate. He said, no, no, don't make me graduate. This is great life. Don't make me graduate. Um, if you're still there at year six, you're as likely to drop out as you are to complete. Uh, time really is the enemy, and it's as simple as life gets in the way. 
people get married, they get divorced, uh, they have children, they move, um, they change jobs, all of which are intervening life experiences that cause students to stop out and then drop out. And the notion that students drop out and come back, it, they're really much more likely to drop out. Uh, where is this particularly relevant to you? I mean, I know you know that students that take concurrent enrollment are more likely to go to college. And as I said, we're kind of winning that battle of getting them to college. Uh, but it's interesting about if you wait one year to go to college, your chances of graduating drop in half. It may be popular to think about going overseas for the year, taking that first year off or getting ready for college, but your chances drop in half. And if you wait till you're 20, five, they drop in half again. Uh, very few students over the age of 25 ever graduate from college. And so starting immediately, uh, and you play a huge role in that, uh, is pretty important. The second area that you play a significant role in um, is intensity. And, and I, I thought this was rather interesting. I've seen a lot of data from states and from researchers. And I've almost started to think about retention as a hollow indicator. It means you came back. It didn't mean you made progress. And, and much more effective indicators are how many credit hours did you accumulate uh, during your first year. And if you accumulated 24 or 30 credit hours, you're substantially more likely to graduate than if you didn't. And there too, you, you play an important part in that. As long as the credit hours that you're helping those students attain count toward those degrees. And I know those are battles that you're fighting out on a regular basis. Do they count toward those degrees? Do they transfer? Uh, in very important conversations uh, because that credit hour accumulation is probably the top indicator as to whether college students will actually be successful in graduating, how many credit hours that they accumulate. So when you start, and the credit hour accumulation is very important. Uh, one. Uh, issue that I wanted to share with you because I think it was really uh, well done in Hawaii. Uh, they started an initiative called 15 to Finish. Um, there are several states and colleges that have uh, promoted this idea. We'll give you an incentive to graduate in four years, maybe $1,000, something like that. Uh, what always reminded me of the conversation I used to have with my sister. And I'd ask her, I'd say, well, what are your goals? And she'd just look at me and she'd say, you mean like, what are my goals this weekend? What am I doing this weekend? Um, <laughs> And that's how students think, to think about that they might have an incentive four years from now, isn't going to happen. So they thought, well, gee, what can we get students to do right this minute? If we can get them to take 15 hours every semester. They ran a campaign in Hawaii called 15 to Finish. To finish. Uh, they've had dramatic increases in the numbers of students taking 15 credit hours. Um, in, they've had huge numbers of students take 12 credit hours. And they thought if they can just get them to take one more course, um, that would be significant. They raised uh, at, at the, uh, their main campus in Honolulu. They had about 35% of their students uh, taking 15 hours as freshmen. That jumped up to 53% after just the first year of this campaign. Pretty substantial. And the, the numbers are going to be pretty impressive in terms of graduating on time and graduating at all. Uh, so strategies around intensity uh, can, can make a huge difference. Um, Another college essentially is giving priority registration for students that, uh, that do that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is this, how long it takes. Um, right now, it takes at a community college four years to get a two-year degree on average, three years to get a one-year certificate. Now, some of that is caused by remediation that we just talked about. They don't get there right away. Um, but all of this, the longer it takes, the less likely it is. So the intensity is terribly important, um, going full time. I just saw some numbers the other day that actually support the numbers we've got in our 30 state database that are really disturbing about part-time students. Uh, this was a report out of NCES uh, for students that are part-time that uh, only 13% of them graduate after six years of attending community colleges, six years. And only one of those percent of those got a four-year degree, actually transferred and got a four-year degree. Five percent got associate degrees and eight percent got, uh, seven percent got certificates. So getting students to take more hours is pretty important. And so the concern, part of the concern is, and we're doing some more research on this, is that, well, students can't do that because they're working 
Interestingly enough, 70% of students that work, work to go to school. And so that means they're working at McDonald's, they're working in retail somewhere, they're piecing together their life so they can go to school. Um, and if they could get better schedules, they could more likely add more hours. Um, but the intensity is just so important uh, to the strategy. In Connecticut, the community colleges in Connecticut, we have somebody here from Connecticut, couple. Um, they started a strategy on their financial aid program of if you had applied for financial aid and you were part-time, uh, they gave them a full-time award. Um, they found out that a lot of students said, well, I could, since I'm working part-time um, and going to school part-time, with this award I actually could go full-time. And over the course of five years, they doubled the number of, of students that were going full-time at statewide at the, at the community colleges uh, in Connecticut. So there are some strategies that can be effective uh, the 15 to finish, the financial aid strategy of, of helping students take and accumulate more credit hours, uh, but you're an important part of that. One of, the, one of the strategies that I like to talk about because it's more, more counterintuitive than any uh, is choice. Um, as it's choice is probably as American as anything is. We love choice. Uh, we want to go to the grocery store and we're not satisfied with one or two bottles of ketchup. There's got to be 57 varieties of, of ketchup. Um, it turns out for college students, that's not so good. Um, and what happens, we have this, I guess, idealistic notion that students choose classes in a rational way. Um, and, and they don't. I mean, most, most colleges have maybe one counselor for four or 500 students. Um, somebody I was speaking with, illustrated this way. If you, were, if you were to put all the counselors together and all the students together and put them a long line, you'd have to wait through 399 students before you could shake a hand with a counselor. Um, so they ask their friends, what are you taking? They look at course titles. They say, how can I not take something Friday afternoon? And that's how they choose courses. And the, the result we get shouldn't be surprising. Uh, just as a, for example, I went back to my alma mater um, online, I said, let's look at history. Uh, it said, first you, and the requirements for graduation, it said, first you need to figure out, um, you need to take it from our common core at Purdue University. I thought, well, this is great. They kind of worked on this. They have a common core. Well, the common core had more than 100 classes to choose from. Um, and then, of course, you know, they have, then you pick somebody from this group, somebody from this group, and somehow this makes a history degree. Well, Mike's, experience at Purdue was different. I was an engineering student. They said, you take these courses this semester, and then after freshman engineering, you pick your, you get accepted to your discipline, um, and then it's a semester by sem semester march to graduation. Uh, they tell me pre-med is the same way. It's a forced march to graduation. Architecture, uh, probably the, one, of the one of the programs with the highest graduation rates on community college campuses, nursing. Uh, not only do they tell you um, which courses to take, what order to take them in, but when to take them. And you don't get to say, well, I don't want to take that blood class. Um, that's not a choice. Um, highly structured program. Many colleges have honors programs. Highly structured programs. Uh, when I shared this with um, Lieutenant Governor Simon of Illinois when we were talking about this, she said, well, Stan, when I went to law school, first year law, that's the way it was. They said, you're taking these courses, and in this order, highly prescriptive programs can be very effective. So how is this playing out? So some colleges have started, not all, but some with academic maps, a semester by semester map to graduation. But some are taking it a step farther called default pathway. And so usually you, you start, as I did with freshman engineering, they start with these broad pathways of, ma of uh, STEM, liberal arts, education, health, and then through the course of the first year, then you narrow and pick your major. Uh, but there, in each case, it's a semester by semester plan all the way to graduation. And you don't have to get permission to register courses that are on your plan. You have to get permission to register courses that aren't on your plan. And it's not that you couldn't take a course that's not on your plan, but you need to get permission. It's a deliberative. Uh, each semester have, has what they call milestone courses, uh, essentially the ones you have to take at Purdue to schedule off, kind of the critical path to graduation. Uh, students, um, they have what they call uh, triggers. 
So if you get a two point in any one semester, you have to see the counselor. If you try not to take your milestone course, you have to see your counselor. If you fall more than two courses behind, you have to see your counselor. Kind of intrusive counseling when these problems happen because they know these students are gonna drop out. So who's doing this? Arizona State's doing it. Uh, they have something called eAdvisor. It's supported through technology. Very impressive. Helps student, they, and they're showing very impressive results with keeping students on track to graduation. Uh, Florida State's been doing this for 10 years. Georgia State for 10 years. Florida State and Georgia State are always held up as the best in the country at the equity gap between white students, Hispanic students, and black students. Uh, Georgia State tells me their Pell students actually graduate at a higher rate because they're part of this program than their non-Pell students. Uh, we call it GPS, Guided Pathways for Success, uh, but we think this is a movement starting across the country. So why is this important to you? Well, it ought to be important, but it's also important to concurrent enrollment because you can be part of that pathway and you should be part of that pathway um, because th th in those pathways, broad pathways, uh, can start in our colleges and it's relevant if those courses that they're taking that are counted as dual credit courses are part of those pathways. Also important, uh, people are struggling sometimes um, at getting um, new pathways started. Um, and I think there may be some people here, but for example, uh, there's some, some efforts underway uh, in computer science, which I call one of the newer sciences. Um, it's not chemistry, biology, or physics. Uh, biotech classes in high school. Um, and so there's some new broadly uh, defined STEM uh, courses in high school that could be college, high school dual credit courses that could help uh, define some of these broad pathways uh, and get students interested in those. And, and I would strongly encourage you to take a look uh, at those courses because in many cases, the way high schools are set up, it's difficult to get high school students, high school teachers certified in the capability to teach those classes. And they won't happen uh, without the support of colleges and universities across the country. Um, and so, for example, uh, in computer science, um, people will say, well, we don't have teachers that are qualified to do that, um, that we don't have the curriculum to do that. Well, that's where colleges could step in in a huge way uh, and, and help make those dual credit courses possible. Uh, so I'd, I'd strongly encourage you to, be, to think about this be part of this uh, and think about this in terms of concur concurrent enrollment. Um, let me close on the, the last theme, and I think it has some, you may have to work a little bit harder on this one to find a translation to concurrent enrollment, uh, except that um, think about it in terms of the, the word that we use, which is structure. Um, and essentially, as I was talking about highly structured programs, uh, this is something that, that uh, was kind of a learning moment for us. Uh, we did a lot of work in Tennessee uh, when we started. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet with Governor Bredesen, uh, the governor of Tennessee, for lunch. They set up a lunch for me, um, thinking, okay, I have a limited amount of time to make my case about what to do in Tennessee, and even probably a more limited time to get the governor's attention. So I prepared one sheet of paper. On it, I had the graduation rates of the community colleges in Tennessee, which averaged to be about 14%. And then on the other side, I had the technology centers. They had about 25 technology centers in Tennessee. There's only about half a dozen states in the country that have, have a post-secondary. These are one-year programs, certificate programs. Uh, the community colleges do the two-year programs. Tech centers do one-year. Tech centers do one-year nursing. Community colleges do two-year nursing. Tech centers do computer science for certificates community colleges to do the two-year associate degree. So I put their graduation rates on the paper. So I didn't actually mention the paper, but he picks it up, looks at it, and he says, tell me what I don't know about my tech centers. How come they have a 75% graduation rate and my community colleges have a 14% graduation rate? Are these students different? Well, actually, the demographics are not different. The ones going to the tech centers a little older, a little poorer, a little more likely to be minority students, probably a little bit more focused because it's career tech. but that's not why this happens. It happens because of structure. Uh, these students go 8.30 to 2.30 Monday through Friday. Uh, they have integrated classes. They start with a cohort. We get to know each other really well, sitting next to each other every day for five days a week. Um, very closely tied to the job market. Uh, they said the integration, they said machine tool, you need a lot of trigonometry, geometry. 
Uh, in most places, you'd be sent to a separate trig class. You'd only get half those students back, but we teach it in the context of machine tool. So people say, well, that's Tennessee. That's the tech centers. It's not a community college. It's not a four-year college. Say, okay, fine. So let's go 1,000 miles away to New York City. Uh, they have a program called ASAP, part of the community college system there. Um, it's liberal arts. 75% uh, of those students transfer their transfer program. Uh, they block their classes. You walk in, they say, Adam, when would you like to go to class, in the morning or the afternoon? You go 8 to 12 in the morning or 1 to 5 in the afternoon. Um, more traditional classes. Uh, they literally have doubled their graduation rate from 25% citywide for the CUNY system to over 55% 55% headed towards 60% uh, in the span of three years. The new community college, which I was just at last week, uh, that's being launched uh, in, in the middle of New York City, has these ba same basic principles. Um, this can happen, highly structured programs. And I know one of the things you wrestle about, and I was kind of amused with what Becky Carter was talking about this morning, about do you have professional development? What does it look like? Is it structured? Uh, is the curriculum structured? What does that look like? How do these things happen? Um, and so in the same way, a lot of the principles of structure can be applied to the concurrent enrollment strategies that you're working with. Because we do know, just like I was talking about, uh, the, the pathways, we knew, do know that more highly structured, more prescriptive, more deliberative strategies are much more effective for these students, especially for the students that we're trying to reach. So I'm, on one hand, I'm concerned. On the other hand, I see great opportunity uh, throughout the country to help huge numbers of students complete more dramatically. Uh, we can't have, and, and I get disturbed when I say, when I hear numbers about, well, these students weren't prepared so they can't be successful, or numbers like, well, what would you expect from the students we've got? These graduation rate numbers are not unexpected. And yet we have places throughout the country that people, faculty members are getting, colleges are getting dramatic results with similar kinds of students. So we could have, we could change, as I started my discussion about the fact that today, less than 10% of those students born in the lowest income quartile never get a four-year college degree. We can change those numbers, and we can change them pretty dramatically. Uh, but it will call for not marginal change, it will call for dramatic change. And you are clearly players as part of that overall strategy and overall movement to see those changes and, and play a clear role in the college completion strategy. And I'm pleased to be able to address you today. Thank you very much for having me. So I think we have about 15 minutes for questions. So who would like to start? Mic runners over here, so just raise your hand and we'll, we'll come over to you. This should be on, I think. You don't. You can just talk. I'm Janet Wallace. I'm from Tennessee. I know I don't sound like it, but I am. <laughs> um, what did Governor Bredesen say about the low rates in the two-year courses? And you said you told us what he said. Right. About so, uh, so we were fortunate um, to uh, Lumina. Uh, Lumina uh, there's a Lumina grant, which you may well be aware of, uh, with the community colleges in Tennessee, um, and they're. Uh, busily, they've already designed, I think, 70 new programs at the community colleges that will have those characteristics that I talked about. They'll be block scheduled, uh, they'll be cohort based, uh, they'll be more of an integrated curriculum. And I think there are 12 community colleges, I think 11 of the 12 are participating um, in that. They had over 100 faculty involved in redesigning those courses. Uh, the legislation that passed in Tennessee, Complete College Tennessee, uh, called for the community colleges to introduce those strategies. Um, um, and, and in addition to that, um, as, as part of that, many of those class, many of those programs are transfer programs, <coughs> and so they've been, they've been, they've been, they've had a huge um, effort underway to make sure that they transfer uh, to the four-year colleges. So that's the kind of thing we'd love to see. Um, I know there's some of my friends from my home state of Indiana here. Um, yeah, Indiana's got a couple programs that they've started that are more aligned to what I was talking about. Uh, one where they recruit students right out of high school that are C plus, B minus students. Um, this is even actually more aggressive. They start them right away. Um, they've raised some money uh, so the students don't have to work. Um, 
but they're showing 70% graduation rate with their first graduating class and three quarters of them going on to college. And then another one that's starting in the trades called the Technology Institute, they also are showing 70 and 80% completion rates where they were showing with the rest of the population still are showing 12% completion rates. Thank you. Thank you for being from Tennessee. and when to place them and because um, I know at the new community college they start with the bridge program is the timing good what what do you see is the um, well this value? is um, this is one of those th and th this is and we spent a lot of time as you might imagine on data but this is actually another one of those counterintuitive counterintuitive ones when I first heard about bridge programs I thought this made sense but the, the, the research doesn't support it um, essentially it says it's more of a sorting mechanism that those that come and do well are the ones you get and the, those that don't, don't. But what does work I is the closer they are to when classes normally start, the shorter and more intensive they are, the more likely they are to be effective. So, so the more contemporaneous they are to the regular college level work, so it's kind of walking you right into the program. Um, to, to give an example of something that might be called a Fall Bridge program is University of Maryland College Park, which is their flagship. Um, and even though they have high admission standards, they still have uh, a number of students that don't, that need remedial math. So they take the first five weeks of their fall course, um, it's five days a week, um, and they do the remedial course. Um, of, they had all failed the test to begin with, 89% pass it after that five weeks. But then the next 10 weeks of the semester is the regular course, but they do five days a week rather than three, so they still have the same instructional time and they pass as if they didn't need remediation to begin with. So the idea is the more contemporaneous it is with the actual college class, the more they know they're walking right into the college level class, like part one, part two. Um, the, it's part of it, a lot of this is psychological I I as much as it is delivering the academic content. If you, especially if you're at a community college, and I know you go to graduation, it's a great thing, see who's on the stage and say, did they get there because they were smart or did they get there because they were persistent? Uh, and overwhelmingly, they persisted. And so you need to worry about how do, we, how do we not put too many, you know, attrition points into this whole strategy. And so uh, even refresher courses, um, for example, I won't say which ones of you, but I bet if you all were administered the math acuplacer test today, But, but if you, had, if you were given a practice guide, a practice test, a couple hours, you'd pass it. And so you need to separate out who needs a refresher from who doesn't know it. And then doesn't know it strategy is much more complex and complicated. Now, I don't know that we've got answers. Uh, but the refresher strategy should be fairly simple. Uh, practice tests, uh, 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 pra uh, giving brush ups before they take tests. Um, short, intensive, um, rather than, you know, rather than traditional courses. Yeah. Where could I, one I, I, I might mention, uh, and I hope you bear with me, an awful lot of what I talked about is human psychology, is how people think, how they react, how they behave. Um, since you're a uh, couple books you might think about, Nudge um, is the one especially about these default pathways. Um, example they give is that uh, in most countries, in our country, the organ donor program you check on when you get your driver's license, we have about 20-25% participation rate. About a half a dozen countries in the world is the check off, they have 90%. Most people like to be guided, most people like to know what pathway they're, they're on. So this kind of opt out, rather than opting into the right thing, put them on the right pathway, let them opt out. So there's a lot of strategy there. Another one is the paradox of choice, um, which talks about too many choices um, and how people struggle to make good choices, uh, given too many choices, especially with too little information. So those are two really interesting books, I think. And so m most everything that I talk about is, is based upon, is in human psychology and based in best practices. These things have happened in other places in the country. Well, you just answered my first question. <laughs> Where could one find printed material about 
the possibility of staying away from developing more remedial classes and moving to in a different direction. So I'll ask my second question. Is there any data or any information available about um, how the published SAT, ACT scare, they can't pass the test, gloom, doom, is published by the same people who are trying to sell AP exams in high school? Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't know that. I, um, in answer to the first question that you didn't ask, um, <laughs> uh, our website has some good, good information on it. It's just completecollege.org. Again, keeping with this theme that this is what we're about, completecollege.org. Um, and there's a lot of good information about best practices and remediation that do work. Um, and, and we have a report up on remediation called Remediation Bridge to Nowhere. Uh, so the, a lot of this data that I talked about is all there. Um, the other um, site, if you want to dig deeper, is the Community College Research Center, CCRC, uh, for out of Columbia University. They do great research on a lot of these issues. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that um, uh, just more broadly on this second issue, it, this also was a learning experience for me. We put in Indiana and I think several other states across the country uh, have essentially um, a college prep, we call it Core 40, uh, that students start out in. They can opt out, but it's a default pathway in high school. And when we fought this battle, it was really interesting because it was, it was I think, alluding to what you were talking about. <coughs> um, there were many counselors who didn't think students could do this work. And we've kind of fought a battle in K-12 about whether students should be given more challenging work or we should leave them in basic math over and over again which hasn't worked uh, and I think we kind of fought that battle I think we kind of won that battle that students really can can achieve a higher levels than they've been challenged um, and I think that's pretty fundamental to what you're trying to do um, working with schools and what we're trying to do at the at the college level is these students really can succeed uh, they need support and they need to be challenged um, and that can happen in advanced placement classes uh, it can happen in college-level work that's given in high school. I had a question. I know I work with the community power system um, in Georgia, and I know you mentioned that a lot of the students who go to college part-time, you know, are not successful in pretty much any of the credentials, whether it be, you know, certificates, diploma, degrees. And for those students who might have, you know, I think 80% of our population are working full-time. So for those students who probably couldn't commit to 8.30 to 2.30, you know, what do you have faith where those students are being successful with some other strategies as far as, you know, completing their credentials in a timely fashion and actually graduating? Well, we do a lot of work in, <coughs> in, in Georgia, and as you probably know, Governor Deals launched Complete College Georgia. Um, but in, and I was, uh, I've been stunned to learn this number, but at, when we were visiting the CUNY system, this is citywide New York City, 85% um, of their students started full-time and then fell to part-time. And nationwide, about 60 to 65% of students at community colleges start at full-time and then fall to part-time. And so why is that? And I don't know that we know the answer, just why is that? Through the course of their college experience, as many as 75% of community college students go full-time at least one semester. So, but, so what's to understand is the typical way that students work is not, there are some working a full-time job and trying to fit this in, but more likely they're working at part-time jobs and piecing that together so they can go to school. 70% of the students are working so they can go to school. So if you could offer a morning block of classes or an afternoon block of classes so you can get your 12 or 15 hours in the morning, that you can then go to your employer and say, I can work every afternoon, I can work every evening, I can work weekends. Right now you go and say, this is what my schedule looks like, how can we fit work in around it? And so in many cases, um, and, and where, where these, these block programs are developing, when you talk to students, and I was just there in New York City talking to students, asking them these questions, and they say, when I got a morning block, it's easier for me to work. When I have an afternoon block, it's easier for me to work. So many more students can be accommodated 
by this. The problem with students that are just part-time all the time is it's so long to get a degree. It, by definition, it's four years to get a two-year degree without remediation. And, it's, and, and, that, and they just can't persist. So too many it's not their lack of persistence, it's the life gets in the way. So the more students that we can um, get into full-time strategies are the better. And there are very few effective part-time programs, but those that are effective have these same principles. It might be you come every Saturday for eight hours for the next two years. Um, and you take two courses at a time. Uh, but the same highly structured strategy. <coughs> Hello, my, my name is Randy Mead from Des Moines Area Community College in Iowa. And typically um, what you see is pretty true and what you've talked about is pretty true. When those math teachers come uh, over to the career and technical areas and teach with some relevance, we see great results. When our students go into their environment, we don't see such good results. In fact, last week in the um, Chronicle, there was an article about STEM delivery, and, and they continued to say that 70% of the math teachers um, use lecture-based instruction. In your experiences nationwide, do you see much of an attempt to be able to change the delivery, to be able to meet multiple intelligences of students, which are different, or do you still continue to see the you know, the same delivery in, in some of these courses where students have not been successful. They haven't been successful in high school, and then we bring them to um, remedial courses, <clears throat> give them the same thing, and, and they're, it's not well received versus math labs, lots of activities, different types of delivery for, for that kind of programming. No, I think, you're, I think you're right. I think we're more likely to, you know, you didn't understand me the first time, so I'll talk louder, thinking that you'll, it's that same strategy as they didn't get it, so we'll give them more remediation. Um, and, and, you know, the whole remediation thing is, is a noble strategy. Uh, it just hasn't worked, and it has to be done differently. And uh, specifically on career tech, one of the things that, that happens, and I would strongly advise people that are working with career tech programs, is I would not use AccuPlace or, or Compass. I would use work keys. Um, and the tech centers use work keys, and, and nationwide ACTs work with employers to have outcomes on work keys, and essentially they run parallel programs, and so we can, except for nursing, at any of the tech center programs, including computer science, including business, if you come in and you're assessed, then you have your assigned time at a computer um, uh, instructional lab, but your assigned time, there are instructors there, and you work to bring your basic skills up to the level that you need for that program while you're working in that program. So you're not, you don't have to do your remediation first. It's, it's, it's not embedded, it's parallel to the program. And it's also because it's work keys and key train is the computer program they use. It's more likely to be relevant, as you pointed out, uh, to the math that they need in those particular programs. And there's, there's some more developing uh, relevance, I think, um, in some of the technology, but it's not quite here yet. Yes, um, my question has to do with qualification of high school teachers, and you said that colleges can. I, I can't. Who's talking? You can't hear. Oh, I'm well, sorry. I can't see. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Bonnie McDougall from Bergen Community College, and my question has to do with qualifying high school teachers, and you made the statement that colleges could step in and make a huge difference. In I'd really like to hear a little bit more about that. So, well, t two things are, are actually two things that, that you can help. One is that as states are moving to requiring more math and science, which is a good thing, <coughs> they're also being more specific about what math and science that is. And they've picked math that we've had for a couple thousand years, like geometry, trig, algebra, and math like in that embodied in computer science is not part of that. And the same thing with science. We've had biology, chemistry, physics for a long time. And biotechnology, uh, computer science, uh, uh, pre-engineering classes, uh, those are struggling to be part of the curriculum. And part of that struggle um, is that they are new sciences and new math. Um, and so they don't count toward the math requirements and the science requirements, although they clearly are math and science. So that's one push-pull strategy that I think you could help with. Um, 
The other is that in many of those disciplines, we wouldn't necessarily have high school teachers that would be qualified to teach that without being licensed by a college, uh, without uh, a curriculum that's being developed with a college, you know, without the support of a college. Um, and so if we had an effort, for example, to have more computer science taught in high schools, right now it would be a struggle if we depended upon simply getting more high school teachers the content and licensing to do that. Uh, but that's where I think colleges can play a significant role, uh, especially in the STEM disciplines, and, and both the introduction of these newer sciences or integrated sciences, as well as uh, bringing the expertise uh, to meet whatever certification requirements might be necessary to do that. Yeah. We may stop here, actually. Um, if you keep well, us on time, we'll take, we'll, <laughs> we'll take this last question. And then <laughs> Thanks for making time. Um, my name is Nicole Bryant, and I am the English Department Coordinator at Laramie County Community College. And so your comments on developmental education are, are very pertinent um, to us in, in composition. Um, and wh where are you from? Uh, Laramie County Community College in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I was just there about a month ago, I think. Um, so one of the questions I have is that you, you talked about a couple different things, but you didn't talk about them together, and I'm interested to see if there's data um, on the intersection. So you're talking about um, what happens when we place students in a sequence of developmental courses and the ways in which that doesn't function for them, um, which we see in English as we do in math. You also talked about the need for, um, for counseling and, and what role that plays. And so oftentimes our developmental instructors find that Students who are entering into those developmental courses may have skill sets they need to strengthen, but another huge piece of that is the lack of support systems that they have in their homes, um, in their communities, uh, that, that run parallel with whatever skills they may or may not have and often become the factors that keep them from returning to classes. Is there data that is beginning to look at the parallels between A, developmental students, and what quote unquote gets them that developmental label beyond a, a simple test of skill set and B, ways we can step in and intercept that have nothing to do with strengthening their skill set alone? Uh, uh, so, three, so three parts. So one is that they can still get, I mean, the, because they're dev ed students doesn't change the fact that they need other support. And, and if you put them into college bearing work with support, like five days a week rather than three, or th then that's a better strategy, gives them more structure. Mm -hmm. But the, some of the other strategies I talked about that could also get triggered <coughs> is what we call this intrusive counseling. Um, and so quite a few colleges are, are initiating early alert systems. Um, I'm a strong advocate for at least the first year taking attendance, which is an underrated policy, but, but, but these colleges that do take attendance are seeing significant differences. Um, there's been studies done that, that if students attend less than half their classes during the first six weeks, none of them complete those courses. Not one percent, none of them do. Um, and so structuring these things uh, can be very important. Um, the, and triggering through early advising these, these intrusive counseling. And then the last thing I want to mention, which is uh, a, a, another way for you to do some good research, and I'd love to see some people do this, um, is that um, there's something called the GRIT survey, G-R-I-T, especially since we're talking about um, motivation and perseverance. Uh, this is work that's been done with the KIPP academies, the charter schools. Uh, they, they, the people that have done this research uh, have also worked with the uh, military academies to try to uh, predict who won't succeed. And rather than looking at academic records, uh, they're looking at student motivation. Do you set goals? Uh, how, how distracted are you to meeting those goals? A number of, it's a simple survey, it's called GRIT. It's out of the University of Pennsylvania, Angela Duckworth. Um, and so uh, I'd strongly have you re recommend you, this is a simple tool that people can use uh, to, to identify some of those students. And then the structural and intrusive counseling are the strategies I'd use, so. Thank you very much for having me, I appreciate it.